The Texas Central proposed project has seen many complications in the past several years. As Halloween approaches, UPD has several tips to stay safe. The Corps of Cadets will host its annual fall festival, and a local haunted house gives scares for a charitable reason. I'm Caroline Wilburn, and welcome back to this week's episode of The Bat Signal. Announced in 2012, private railroad company Texas Central proposed its idea for a self-described Texas high-speed train that will be the first truly high-speed train project in the U.S. and Texas, according to its website. However, the now decade-old project has shown nothing but slow progress. Here to tell us more is news writer Anna Rimfro. Anna, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. So, what is this proposed project exactly? The alluring proposal for the infrastructure project claims that its 240-mile-long track will connect Texas through three passenger stations in North Texas, Brazos Valley, and Greater Houston within a 90-minute high-speed train ride. According to the project timeline, Texas Central estimates that the project is to be completed by 2026, when the railway will be fully operational for commercial use. And what's the cost of this project? Texas Central estimates the project to cost $20 billion to complete. However, they expect the project to have a direct cumulative economic impact of $36 billion over the next 25 years. Texas Central also estimates that construction will create 17,000 jobs and 1,500 permanent jobs once the railway is operational. Texas Central states that the project will be privately funded and describes the proposed railway project as, quote, a taxpayer, not a tax taker. And who is this project intended to help? The fully electric railway project targets nearly 100,000 Texan supercommuters who travel between Houston and Dallas-Fort Worth more than once a week, according to Texas Central and a study conducted by Mitchell L. Moss and Carson King. The project aims to provide an efficient and environmentally low-impact travel method, but the project is currently overshadowed by its growing history of legal issues and lack of public development. And can you give us some more details on those issues? Notably, multiple legal cases have been pursued because of Texas Central's tactics to acquire land through eminent domain. According to Cornell Law School, local, state, and federal governments can enact eminent domain to take private property for public use if the property owners are properly compensated. Property owners who live along the railway's proposed route have been protesting against the construction of the railway for years. Texas Central has been adamant about conducting surveys of private property for its route, but many affected landowners don't want to give the project right-of-way permission for the route. And I understand that you reached out to Texas Central for a comment. Um, How did that go? The battalion reached out to Texas Central for an interview, but Texas Central declined, instead offering a comment. Quote, It has been an eventful summer for Texas Central, and we continue to move forward, right-of-way director Katie Barnes wrote. On behalf of the company, Barnes also wrote that there will be no additional information to share beyond the most recent press release from July 8th. Before the most recent release, its last release was published on September 21st, 2020. Quote, Texas Central remains open for business under its new management. It's continuing to seek further investment and is moving forward with the development of this high-speed train, Barnes wrote. The press release is short, giving little substantial information regarding the project's progress. Texas Central briefly thanked project investors and stakeholders, stating that the company has made significant strides in the project over the last several years. Quote, we look forward to being able to say more about this at an appropriate time in the near future, Texas Central wrote. Well, I guess only time will tell. Thank you so much for coming on, Anna. Thanks for having me. festivities are well underway in College Station, and the University Police Department has several tips to keep students safe during the upcoming holiday. UPD suggests students stay aware of crime in the area, specifically any suspicious activity. Suspicious activity is defined as anything that is out of place, and students can report this by calling 979-845-2345. To prevent theft, Special Operations Sergeant Josh Dillion said students can get items engraved for free at the police department. Thefts and burglaries have been the top reported crimes this fall. Sergeant Delion said, quote, During Halloween, we typically see more suspicious activity, just people playing pranks. This fall, we have seen an increase in theft calls, whether that ranged from bikes, scooters, computers, and unfortunately, even catalytic converters. While suspicious activity can increase during Halloween, Sexual Assault Resource Center, or SARC, Executive Director Lindsay LeBlanc said sexual assaults will not. LeBlanc said, quote, The thing that we see with sexual assault is that it doesn't discriminate. There are no particular situations, incomes, that become a higher risk. 
We do know that there are certain situations that make the likelihood of sexual assault higher, and one of those is actually interpersonal relationships. 80% of survivors know their perpetrators. As for how to stay safe during the upcoming holiday, Dillion suggests students be aware of their surroundings by staying off their phones and not using headphones. He said this allows others to know that one is alert and not an easy target. DeLeon said, quote, if anything happens, get to a safe place and then contact the police department. You can contact our emergency line or you can contact 911 and let us know what's going on. We can get officers or get you medical assistance if necessary. You can read this entire article originally written by Amanda Hare published on thebat.com. One of AM's oldest traditions invites you to celebrate their most recent new tradition. Here to talk more about the upcoming Corps of Cadets Fall Festival is life and arts writer John Chapa. Thank you so much for coming on, John. Yes, thank you. So, can you tell us a little bit about when this event is going to take place? So, the Corps will host their annual regiment's fall festival from 5 to 10 p.m. on Friday, October 28th. Students, families, and community members are invited to enjoy fall festivities in a haunted house in the heart of the quad. The event started in 2019 and is entirely planned and put on by the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Regiments of the Corps. So, what makes this event so unique to the Corps? Nuclear Engineering Senior and 3rd Regiment Officer Providence Andrews said the event is a way for the community to view and connect with the Corps in a more relaxed atmosphere. Civil Engineering and 2nd Regiment Officer Caroline Slaughter said the event is also a great way for cadets of different outfits and regiments to become more involved with each other. Okay, and what type of events are going to be taking place? So the Haunted House is a unique aspect of the Fall Festival planned specifically by the 3rd Regiment. The event will take place on the Quad in Keast Hall. The planning process for the Haunted House started months in advance, Andrew said. Only cadets a part of the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Regiments are involved in putting on the Fall Festival. However, all cadets will attend the number of festivities the regiments have planned, Slaughter said. Okay, and how can the community get involved? Patrons can take part in the activities with a number of tickets they purchase at the entry. All proceeds benefit the regiments putting on the festival. The Corps halted the event in fall 2020 due to COVID-19. Since then, the Corps has planned to grow the celebration and is ready for their biggest fall festival yet, Slaughter said. You can learn more about the regiment's fall festival at their website. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Halloween is the perfect time to indulge in local frights, especially if it's for a good cause. Here to talk more about a Bryan College Station local Halloween event is life and arts writer Emma Lawson. Emma, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you. I love being here. (laughs) Yeah, so can you tell us a little bit more about this event? Yeah, so Fright Nights is an annual event held by Nonprofit Theater Stage Center, where participants can walk through a haunted house and have proceeds donated to charities. This year, Fright Nights is donating to Star Kids, an outdoor program to help kids of fallen veterans and first responders. It is recommended that children under the age of 15 do not attend without an adult present, and tickets can be purchased at the event from 7.30 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. for $10, and participants are encouraged to pay in cash due to Wi-Fi being unpredictable. Yeah, so can you tell us a little bit about the history of this event? Yeah, so Cindy Roberts is the organizer of Fright Nights and past president of Stage Center and said she's seen the event grow in size. Roberts said, quote, we just had to move out of downtown Bryan, so now we're over on Briarcrest Drive. Robert said she buys all props and costume pieces herself so they can donate as much as possible to local charities. Yeah, so how does this event make sure that it's safe for all attendees? Yeah, that's a great question. To ensure the safety of everyone involved in Fright Nights, actors stay an arm's length at all times and don't get up close to anyone's faces. Although scare actors are recommended to be over 18 years old to participate, anyone 16 and up with parents' permission is also allowed, Robert said. And I understand that you got to interview one of the scare actors. What did they say about the event? Yeah, Sophia Colwell has been a scare actor at Fright Nights for two years and said she enjoys the community that comes together for Fright Nights. Colwell said that most people run away from the monsters while others have different reactions to getting scared, such as flirting with the scare actors. Bringing a larger group of people is more fun for the scare actors, Colwell said, and each Fright Night experience is unique. Awesome. Sounds like a great event. Thank you so much for coming on, Emma. Thank you. It's a spooky fun time. (laughs) This week's contributors are Amanda Hare, Anna Renfro, John Chapa, and Emma Lawson. Make sure to check out previous episodes of The Bat Signal and Home Turf, available wherever you get your podcasts.